Hello and welcome to episode 426 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Faye and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm good. Well, I say I'm good. I'm looking at my hands as I, I make the podcast, which seem to be slightly scuffed because I had to break into my own house yesterday. So classic family went out the house, left the key in the lock indoors, inside. So when trying to open or lock the door from the outside we couldn't and cue a period of about an hour in which I was trying to break into my own house which I have to say I did successfully in the end using an umbrella uh, (laughs) of all implements but just goes to show that yeah you have to be careful people can break into your house with an umbrella but yeah don't leave the key in the door when you leave the house so yeah that was the highlight of my week so far. I actually feel like I could possibly break into houses because one of my favorite YouTube channels, and I don't know why I started watching this, is a guy called The Lock Picking Lawyer. And he his whole thing is about showing you how you can pick locks. I don't know how it's legal. He is, is, is it a hobby for him? Is it like a passion? Well, he's him? actually a lock picker and he, you know, he, he that's his business. And a lawyer. Well, I don't know what the lawyer is. No, maybe maybe listeners can tell us. Um, yeah, yeah, but I I think I've seen this over your shoulder one time. You showed me, and it is actually quite interesting because he explains how they work as well. Yeah. But no, I didn't. I was almost having to do brute full. So yeah, it was a bit of a, a bit of a stressful start to the week. I didn't want to have to pay for a locksmith. Well, I suppose that's your punishment because you have been on holiday and you have had that chill time and now you've had the stress too. Uh, So what have we got coming up on this week's show? So on this week's show, I'm going to be doing a piece based upon famous quotes from usually famous investors on investing that you can learn from. So I'm going to talk about the quotes. Then I'm going to do a piece on pocket money. So some research has come out on levels of pocket money for children at different ages across the UK, different regions, in fact, across the UK and comparing it to previous years, but also the levels on average paid to children for doing chores. So it's something that we've talked about in the office before. Do you give your children pocket money? If so, how much do you pay them for chores? Well, we're going to give you the answer to that part. And the final piece on the podcast, Andy, you are going to be doing. That's right. I'm going to be covering premium bonds. There's been an increase once again to the prize pool for the premium bonds, meaning that the notional interest rate now is up to 4.65%. To give you some context, it was around about one and a half to two percent just last year. So it's really boosted that prize fund. So we'll be diving into that and talking about whether premium bonds are worth it. So let's kick off with the investment quotes. Then if you look at the famous quote, Warren Buffett seems to be responsible for most of them. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a whole bunch that Warren Buffett isn't involved in. And I'm going to give you a list of those that Warren Buffett has apparently said. Now, you've got to take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. These people are apparently attributed with saying these quotes according to various sources on the internet. But I mean, of course, some of these things can be debatable, but that's not really important. The quotes and lessons themselves are are what is interesting rather than who actually said it. So let's kick off with the non Warren Buffett lessons, first of all. So the first one, the four most dangerous words in investing are this time is different. And that was said apparently by Sir John Templeton, who was an investor and philanthropist known for his global investing strategy. So this time is different is thing that you read a lot or it's implied by analysis or quotes that you see in the press. It could be, for example, the AI boom we're getting at the moment, talking about technology stocks that are soaring. So there have been comparisons drawn between now in investment markets where prices are elevated and the dot-com era. So when the bubble burst, we got to the end of the 90s into the early 2000s. And part of that is because of those elevated prices, but also because technology stocks are driving a lot of the enthusiasm that we're seeing investors. At the moment, it's AI stocks, so artificial intelligence related companies. Now, what you might hear are people trying to justify that things won't suddenly blow up like they did back in the dot-com bubble and then this subsequent burst. So the phrase this time is different is refers to that kind of thing where you're comparing a scenario where perhaps you're expecting something to happen through lessons of history things aren't panning out the same way as history has suggested yes things can be different things do change but Even if things are different, saying this time is different. It's been said many times in the past and people have fallen foul of it when things like markets have corrected. Bear in mind that often things aren't different. So I'm not predicting the market's about to crash, but bear in mind just believing that things will be different doesn't mean that that will actually pan out. Next one is 
in investing, what is comfortable is rarely profitable. And that was apparently said by Robert Arnott, who is a pioneer in quantitative investing and founder of Research Affiliate. So this one is a good reference to the fact that you are going to have to take some risk if you want an increased chance of reward. So it's that risk versus reward balance. So occasionally it may feel uncomfortable when you're investing, but if that is the case, then maybe you are taking too much risk, but you do have to take some risk if you do want that increased reward. The problem you have, there are people out there who want their cake and eat it. They want to have the increased returns, but they aren't happy taking that extra risk. At the moment, you get pretty good returns on savings accounts. I'll just throw that in, actually, that is an easy access savings account now that you can get 5% interest on. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes of this podcast. So the lesson from that quote is regarding risk versus reward. The next one I'm going to look at is the goal of a successful investor is to make money, not to be right all of the time. And I really like this one. This is George Soros. So George Soros is a billionaire investor and he's known for his currency speculations. He once famously bet against the pound and made a lot of money. And the point of investing is you are not going to get everything right. Sometimes you make investments and they may fall in value, but the problems only arise if you make too many of those and lose too much money on those particular investments. Now, I run a portfolio on 8020 Investor and I will change funds looking for better opportunities and there will be times where I will crystallize losses. But over the long run, I have made a profitable investments because I get more right than I do wrong. And I also have made more money on the ones I've got right than the money I've lost on the ones that I've got wrong. So being an investor, you're not going to get everything right. And being comfortable with that, I think is a key part of being a successful investor. And George Soros is one of the most successful investors out there. So take his word for it. And actually, the next quote is from him, which is, I'm only rich because I know when I'm wrong. And so that goes on to the fact that knowing when you're wrong and to cut your losses is important in investing. There are a lot of people who buy investments and they stick with them as they keep tumbling. Just because an investment has fallen in value doesn't mean it's necessarily going to mean revert. I know that happens frequently with investment markets, but something could be falling because it's actually imploding. So knowing when to cut your losses, one way of doing that is to have an investment process. We talked about process and decision making a lot on the podcast, but the 80 20 investor approach that I use makes sure that I'm not emotional when I make investment decisions. So I have a process where I will look at other opportunities, the performance of the investments I have, and then I will move out of that when I feel the time is right. But also, it may mean I don't get it right. I might sometimes change investments, and actually, if I'd held on to it, it may have come good in the end. But often, what happens is you can find a better opportunity elsewhere that you can end up making more money on in the long run anyway. So, there's been plenty of people who've held on to funds and they've ended up accruing bigger losses. Now, a lot of that stuff is obviously with the benefit of hindsight. But as a general rule of thumb, George Soros says that he's only rich because he knows when he's wrong. It's not what you own that will send you bust, but what you own. And that's an anonymous quote. And that's really talking about managing debt and leverage. So there are things like ETFs that are leveraged. So what they do is they use borrowed money to increase the returns on the investment. So you might get, for example, three times the movement on the spot price of gold. But that does mean you get the amplified increases in that spot price, but also the falls. So you, what you can do is it amplifies your gains and your losses. So leverage is, from my point of view, something which should be only used by people who are very experienced and understand it. I would never use it. And obviously, CFDs are another product out there where there is leverage. So be careful. If you see the quotes that the FCA make these firms put on their sites, it's somewhere between 75 and probably 80% of customers lose money using some of these products that use leverage. So be aware, leverage can be very dangerous. Investing should be more like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, take eight hundred dollars and go to las vegas that was that was said by paul samuelson who was an economist and nobel laureate i mean that speaks for itself investing should be boring the best time to invest was 20 years ago the second best time is now that's another anonymous quote unknown author i like that because that just teaches people listen to the podcast what will happen people look at the market say going back to it could be after the pandemic when the markets crashed and think i wish i'd got in then or it could be last year when markets crashed or i wish i got in then one of the lessons i've learned is that you can't time the market. I remember when I launched AG20 Investor and I had my own 50K portfolio, it was in March 2015, and the market was at all-time highs at that point. 
And there was a part of me where I was thinking about, well, I'm about to invest this money to show people how you invest. But doing it right at the top of the market feels somewhat risky, almost that you are on a hiding to nothing in a way. You're going to probably lose money if the markets crash. But I could have sat there and kept doing that. But following process, putting money into the market, and of course, we are where we are now, up over 50%. And the point is that you can use tactics like dripping money into the market. We talk about pound cost averaging. If you're worried about the volatility in market, so we'll put links to shows where we talk about those concepts like pound cost averaging. But the main thing is to be invested in the market. Now, the other one is the investor's worst enemy. It's not the stock market, but his or her own emotions. That again speaks for itself. One thing when you see markets go up and down, there is always a tendency for you to become emotionally involved and make a knee jerk decision. I say always a a tendency, I should say there is a danger. And that's why I don't look at my portfolio regularly. I will only look at it typically about once a month and then decide if I'm going to do anything with my portfolio. But in the long run, you shouldn't have to look at your portfolio. Even once a year would be sufficient if you're only going to review it then. If you're following a passive strategy, for example, it's invest and forget. So those parts of my investment portfolios where I'm putting into passives, I would just never look at it. I just regularly contribute to it. So be aware of emotional decisions that you could possibly make and try and mitigate that. Again, following processes. It's not about time in the market, but time in the market. Again, an anonymous quote. That's all about being a long-term investor. So if you keep dipping in and out, the chances are you're going to miss those bounces. You'll see research that shows that the best days in the stock market regularly follow in short succession after the worst days in the market because you gain your markets tend to oversell and then they'll pick back up again as people buy the dip when you get towards that bottom so that's again triggered by emotional decision making people panic sell at the bottom and then people step in normally seasoned investors start to buy things when they think they're cheap and the market picks up next risk management is the key to survival in financial markets that's about diversification so managing risk i always think about the idea that if you are worried about your investments at night, you're not sleeping, you're worried about market sell-offs, or you're worried about the fact that you might be losing money or might lose money, then you're taking too much risk. If you're worried that markets might go up and you're not going to take advantage of that, then you are taking too little risk. So risk management is key. Don't look for the needle in the haystack, just buy the haystack. That was obviously John Boggle, who was the founder of the Vanguard Group. So it was really seen as the godfather of low-cost passive investing, which obviously is a a very good piece of advice. So passive investing for the long term, just buy the market, you buy a tracker, for example, you get recessions, you have stock market declines. If you don't understand that's going to happen, then you're not ready. You won't do well in the markets. That was Peter Lynch, who's a former fund manager and also author. That's again about understanding investment markets. It's a bit like I always tend to say about if you're going to surf, then you're going to have to get wet. And if you don't understand that fact, you shouldn't be on the water. Similar sort of idea. The stock market is filled with individuals who know the price of everything, but the value of nothing. That was Philip Fisher, who was a renowned investor, of course. But talking about the idea of finding value when you're investing in something, which will lead nicely onto Warren Buffett's lessons in a second. And the biggest risk is not the risk itself, but the failure to mitigate it. That is a referenced again to the potential for risk and diversification. So buying a range of different assets. It's not whether you're right or wrong that's important, but how much money you make when you're right and how much you lose when you're wrong. So that's George Soros again. The market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. I like that one. And so the lesson there is patience is key if you want to be a successful investor. There are going to be ups and downs in markets, but holding for the long term, markets do tend to go up over time. So the longer time frame you have, the more risk you, you can take if you're comfortable with taking more risk, but be patient. A good example of this was the post pandemic era. Everybody wanted to become a, an investor. So you remember there was a period where if you look at companies results, so look at some of the platforms, they had record years in terms of new customers, because people had furlough payments, they weren't spending money. So people started speculating on the stock market. And then markets would start to rebound and started to go up. But then obviously, as what never to be happens in these sort of scenarios, you have a pullback, people started to lose money, people panicked. We then in subsequent years had market fall again when we got to 2022. People started bailing out of markets. They'd lost money. They were not patient enough to wait for markets to recover. But more importantly, just to ride these ups and downs. And so they lost money, bailed out. And what ended up happening is the people who bought in at the lows 
They may have drip money in over time. They are the patient people who would have picked up things at a good price or cheaper that inevitably rose over time that we've seen since. So patience is important when it comes to investing. Otherwise, you make knee-jerk decisions. And the thing I worry about, there are a lot of people after the pandemic who will have been burned slightly because of investing in just single stocks rather than buying a diversified portfolio and those people may never come back to investing and be able to grow their wealth so that is something unfortunately i think we're going to see in the in the period going forward now i'm going to move over to warren buffett so warren buffett is known for loads of different quotes on investing if you go to episode 291 of this podcast i'll put a link i listened to the show before coming on to do this one and it was a a really good roundup of lessons from Warren Buffett's style of investing and his career. I included a couple of quotes that he'd said, three of them, but I've got some more here, actually, different ones. But the lessons from Warren Buffett are definitely worth listening to. So go listen to that podcast. But the lessons from his quotes, this one is just almost comical. Rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. (laughs) And that is more about avoiding drawdowns as well. So avoiding losing money, if you can, that will probably in the long run well, it will increase your returns. I mean, it's easier said than done, but I think it's more about not taking excess risk. His most famous quote is probably, I will tell you how to become rich, close the doors, be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. So that is the idea that people tend to, rather than buy at the lows and sell at the highs, they tend to do the opposite. So when the market is at the lows, they sell and panic, but then when they go and buy at the highs, because they obviously getting greedy and jumping into the market, fearing that they're going to miss out. So that is the opposite that you should be doing. You should be buying low and selling high, of course. Warren Buffett, other famous quotes include the most important quality for an investor is temperament, not intellect. I like that because I do think there are a lot of people who think that investing is difficult and it's not for them. And you've got products out there in terms of robo-advice propositions. You've got things like Vanguard, lots of trackers. Investing is for everyone. You can buy a diversified portfolio now incredibly cheaply. On that, when I think about investing it being difficult, I've had conversations with friends and they broach the subject of investing. They've got some spare money and they say, oh, I'm not, it's not really for me. I'm not going to get into it. And I say, well, have you got a pension? And they'll say, yeah. I said, well, you're already investing. Yeah. And then that's a really good way for them to go, oh, okay. So my, my pension fund is taking risk. It's just that I'm not sort of actively involved with it. Yeah. And I think people confuse investing with like day trading. When owning stocks, owning bonds, owning a portfolio of investments is actually investing. So it can be boring and should be boring. The quotes I've already read out explain that from successful investors. And as the quote from the founder of Vanguard said, well, if you don't know what to buy, you buy the whole market. And that is possible. And of course, it never used to be possible or as easily accessible to ordinary investors, so armchair investors. So now you don't have to pick the next stock or company to back to become the next big thing you can buy them all already and the thing that i find interesting you get people who understand companies in terms of what their products they sell apple for example and they might love what they do they might they might have all of the apple's products yet they would never think about investing in apple and so I'm not saying you go and invest in the things that you buy as a consumer, but these companies and these large companies, Apple in particular, have a huge influence in the market. You don't have to just buy a single company, but you will spend lots of money and be one of their customers and they make lots of profit from you. You can actually share in that profit by owning some of their stock. So risk comes from not knowing what you're doing is another Warren Buffett phrase. That is true if you do something very crazy, esoteric, take too much risk. But if you don't know what you're doing, again, you don't have to. You can use some of these robo-advice propositions. You can use things like trackers, build portfolios. There are tools, articles that we'll link to that anyone can do it. I think if you try and do something that goes beyond your own understanding, know what your limits are, know what you understand, try and learn more, but you can get somebody else to do it for you very cheaply. Days gone by, you couldn't, but you can do now. Opportunities come infrequently, says Warren Buffett, but when it rains gold, put out the bucket, not the thimble. That's about capitalizing on rare opportunities. I think that's quite a difficult one to put into practice. But it does emphasize about the idea that some of your biggest gains might come from parts of your portfolio. I think that's one way I'd like to look at that, not just a whole portfolio going up at once. You might have positions that do particularly well. And it's one of the reasons why I don't hold lots and lots and lots of different funds. I have a slightly concentrated portfolio at times because it means that, therefore, if something like that happens, then I might have a bit of a bucket out rather than a thimble to take advantage 
So I'm going to rattle through the rest of these. I'm conscious of the time. So the investor of today does not profit from yesterday's growth. That's really his way of saying don't rely on past performance. It doesn't predict future returns. Never depend on a single income. Make investments to create a second source. Now, I like that as a general uh, rule if you're investing for income. So get a diversified portfolio of sources of income. So you get different income funds. So if one fund doesn't pay out at the same rate, it has to cut its dividends effectively or its payouts, then you will have a range of funds that hopefully if they invest in different companies and different assets you can have a sustainable income throughout your retirement for example but also i just think that's a good rule to live life by have a more than one income stream next is if you don't find a way to make money while you're asleep you will work until you die that's loosely linked to investing because your investments will hopefully provide you a retirement income so Life generally works that you end up getting paid for what you do when you're young, so a job, but then you move through life and you need to transfer to a a point where you get paid for what you own. So you start building wealth and assets. So you then generate income from those assets. When you're young, you don't own anything. And there was a transition point throughout life. And I think what tends to happen, it's become more difficult, I have to admit, for some younger generations to own things property for example but they can own other types of assets when it comes to investing but you've got to try and build wealth trying to own things over time if you don't want to work until you die and the next one is do not save what is left after spending but spend what is left after saving so that's putting the priority on paying yourself first which is a very good rule of thumb to live by and finally the best investment you can make is an investment in yourself the more you learn the more you earn so Those are the lessons from some of the best investors that's been, well, they have been in history. Some of them are actually quite good life lessons. So take those, learn from them, and hopefully you can become a better investor. Okay, so let's move on to the next piece then. We're going to be looking at pocket money, and there's been some research done by one of the leading pocket money apps. What have we got, Daniel? So Go Henry, they do a regular piece of research that they update each year, and the latest update covers 2022, and it looks at the levels of pocket money that the children are paid in the UK. So I'm going to go through the numbers in 2022. So the average pocket money a week for a six-year-old was £3 and 4p. Now the average for a seven-year-old is £3.26. It gradually goes up until you get to, it seems to be a bit of a jump from an 11-year-old gets £6.21 on average to a 12-year-old, presumably once they start going to secondary school, and they get £8.14. The average 13-year-old is £10.31. And then as it goes up, when they get to 18, they get £12.28. So we'll put a link in the notes of this podcast to the article where this data is collated. So that gives you an idea of what the average is. You shouldn't feel obliged to match these, of course, everybody's individual. And one thing I would point out that wasn't really teased out in the research itself, but if you compare the numbers to a year earlier in 2021, there is generally a fall of around about 40 to 50p per age group. And that is really, in my view, uh, an impact of the cost of living crisis. So people, I think, are paying their children less pocket money now than they were. So that is something not to feel bad about. That just shows you that is happening around the country. If I give you a quick overview on the different regions, then London, the average weekly pocket money is £9.96. Compare that to the North East, that's £6.84 a week. And you've got the Midlands East Midlands is £6.57, West Midlands £6.46. And if you look at the South East, it's £7.85. Scotland is £8.09. And again, all of those regions generally have seen a decline from the year previously. So I now want to quickly give you a roundup about chores, because there are people who pay their children for doing chores to encourage them. And this is the rough price that children are paid for a chore on average. So homework is the best paid chore, it seems, in the UK. £1.18 on average per chore. So that's I don't know, it's just doing your whole homework. Tidying a room is one pound and two pence. Making the bed is 81 pence. Loading and emptying the dishwasher, which people in my household could do that a bit more frequently, 88 pence. Putting clothes away, 71 pence. Brushing teeth, 72 pence. I thought that was just hygiene. But read every day, 96 pence. Yeah, reading is definitely a battle in my household. Recycling, rubbish. 77 pence getting ready for school (laughs) that's a legal requirement to go to school but getting ready for school 77p and feeding pets again i wish wish my children would feed my cat more regularly than they do 92 
pence. So there you go. That's a roundup of what's going on in the UK. It's quite interesting there to hear some of that data. And the reason they're able to be so detailed on that data is obviously they pull it from details that parents actually put in via the app. So if you're interested in doing that, then do take a look at the reviews we've done. We've reviewed Go Henry and a couple of the other apps that do similar things to do with pocket money. We'll put that in the link in the show notes. Yeah, and there are a range of products out there. I mean, Go Henry is one that charges, but there are others that aren't pocket money exclusive products. Revolut being one. If you have a Revolut account, you do get one free children's under 18s card with that. So you can use that to give them money in a similar way. You can't pay them for chores. You can do that on Go Henry. So you can pay them per chore. You can set that up. But you are able to transfer money onto a card that then children can use in the shops. They can even use it abroad, in fact. And they can learn about how to use money. And on that, I'm going to mention something, Andy, a future podcast. In a couple of weeks, we're going to do a bit of a compilation of our best stuff to do with teaching children about money in the lead up to kids going back to school. Okay, so let's move on to the final piece of the podcast then. And this is just a short piece to talk about premium bonds. We've talked about premium bonds before in the podcast. It was a little while ago now. That was episode 281, where we posed the question, are premium bonds any good? Well, I can kind of answer that now. Premium bonds are becoming pretty good because they have increased the notional rate of interest. Now, the reason it's called a notional rate of interest, premium bonds don't work in the same way as a usual savings account. The return you get on those are not guaranteed. It works very similar to a lottery. You pay money into premium bonds, you get premium bonds in values of £1 each. You do need to spend at least £25 to get your initial investment into those bonds. But then those bonds act as tickets like lottery tickets. And there are a number of prizes ranging from £25 right up to a million pounds. And if you're lucky enough to win on the premium bonds, then you win a reward. And that's either paid back to you directly into your bank account, or you can choose it to be reinvested as extra bonds. So your premium bonds are entered month on month into draw so unlike lottery tickets where you get a ticket that goes in that week and it's done premium bonds your tickets are entered into draws forever and any money that you win that's effectively your return so if you don't win any money then you don't make any return so you'd have a zero return and inflation would eat away at that so it's something that you're entered into month on month and the top prizes are, is it still a million pounds there's two top prizes of one million pounds but what's interesting the reason we're bringing it to the podcast this week is that there's been an extra 66 million pounds boost and what these equate to is additional prizes in the prize pool so for example this month there's an additional 269,000 prizes which equates to that 66 million boost and it means that you've got a higher chance of winning which is this notional interest rate that's been boosted so and that's obviously when you say they've added those prizes those prizes will be added in each month going forward yeah in addition to what was already there so for example the current month in august the prize pool was around about 405 million pounds well for september it's been boosted up to 400 70 million pounds with another 269,000 prizes mixed into that. So it means that the odds of winning has gone down from July from 24,000 to one to September, it will be 21,000 to one. I mean, it still sounds like you've got no chance of winning, but genuinely those differential in the odds is quite significant. Yeah. And you're talking about winning any prize. That's correct. Because what's the smallest prize you can get? 25 pounds. So, and, and obviously you've got the big prize, which the odds of winning that are way, way higher than actually your chances of winning the national lottery. So the overall rate that, that equates to the overall price pool when we talk about the price pool and the rate if you owned every premium bond in existence then the you'd win every price the return you therefore get it's now gone up to 4.65 percent and again if you actually look back on what it was this time last year it was barely just over one and a half percent so it's a significant rise in the last year we've had month on month increases so it is getting better yeah and this is clearly a, a reflection of what's going on with the bank of england base rate to make them still appealing in any way they've had to increase that effective rate to the point where it can be attractive don't forget any winnings that you have are tax free so premium bonds become attractive to high rate taxpayers so people who are paying tax that have used ISO allowances for example but a way of potentially trying to get a return on their money but also their government bank so it's not like a, a bank that could go bust and you have to have the financial services compensation scheme and look out for that premium bonds they are backed by the government so your money is a hundred percent secure that's right and so what i'll do then damien is i'll put a link to the latest news article that explains about the prize boost 
in the show notes. And I'll also put our main premium bonds article, which goes into the technicalities of the product and why you would consider it. We'll pop a, a link to that in the show notes yeah. as well. And just to give you a quick roundup of the pros and cons, obviously you do have that potential for a big prize. There is no risk because they are government backed in a tax-free winnings that I mentioned earlier and you can withdraw your money at any time about any charges and you can put in fifty thousand pounds into premium bonds that's each person so if you are a couple for example you could each put fifty thousand pounds in but the odds of winning are really where you might come unstuck because it is estimated that most people who have premium bonds won't win anything in their lifetime so inflation is the real killer for premium bonds because your money will be eroded by inflation and we're talking about its purchasing power what you can buy with it if you don't win anything over the long run because obviously as we know inflation is running very high so that is it for this week isn't it andy as ever do make sure you review the podcast on your app of choice do send in your reviews and we will read them out and you may win a money to masses mug also don't forget to join the facebook group facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the masses and follow us on all the other social channels that we have so instagram in particular i like and i'm on threads more and more at the moment i'm not sure how much of the rest of the world is remaining on threads but for the time being what i'm doing is putting on some quite lengthy threads that teach you about money so for example i did a whole popular thread that was talking about how to become financially independent and each time i linked to different resources and tools so it's a very good way if you just followed me on threads that you're going to learn a hell of a lot about money that's right and don't forget our youtube channel as well we've just popped an, uh, a video up there about house prices and what's happening with those go and check out our youtube channel and do make sure you subscribe because if all of you who listen to the podcast when i'm subscribed we'll have one of the most popular money youtube channels out there yeah so go and do it even if you're not going to watch us just subscribe anyway so that is it for this week until next time until next time oh.